With summer comes heat, and with heat comes hazard. As a loyal listener of the Live Inspired podcast, you all know by now that the Keeley Companies is the leader and single source for investment, development, management, construction, and restoration. Keeley Companies also understands that there is nothing more important than returning their team members home safely to their family each and every day. As we begin heading into the hot summer months, their very own VP of Risk Management, Rob Miller, has three key tips to staying safe in the summer heat. Rest, water, and shade. If you're going to be outside this summer, don't forget the importance of rest and water and shade. By empowering Keelians to do their part and follow practical tips for safety, it's clear why Keely Companies is recognized for their world-class safety culture, Keely Safe. You can learn more about Keely Safe and the work of Keely Companies by visiting them online at KeelyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. We often think of the word persuasion as corrupt, shady, or untrustworthy. And while it may have some of those connotations, today's guest sees it radically differently. Jason Harris is co-founder and CEO of award-winning creative advertising agency, and he's the best-selling author of The Soulful Art of Persuasion. There it is, The Soulful Art of Persuasion. Blending soul and science, Jason's going to help iconic brands like Peloton, Ben & Jerry's, and many others thrive. He's got a great story. Using originality, generosity, empathy, and soul, Jason shares his secrets to cultivating character-building behaviors that are critical to both personal and professional success. If you're looking for the framework to build meaningful relationships in every single aspect of your life, today's conversation is for you. So my friends, buckle up, get ready for the ride as I bring on a persuasive guest indeed, his name is Jason Harris. Jason, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Hey, thanks for having me, John. When you meet someone for the first time and they ask you what you do, how do you respond to that? Jason Harris, what do you do for a living? I'm an entrepreneur and I started a advertising agency. I'm an ad man at heart. That's kind of how I define myself in the traditional sense of how you would sit, talk about your career. I think of myself more as like a entrepreneur and my business that I understand the most is marketing and advertising. Unlike, I think maybe most people that kind of find themselves pinballing into what they end up with for a career. I, I kind of knew that's what I was kind of always going to do. When you're not working, when you're not being an entrepreneur, when you're not uh, covering p and what do you like to do for fun? I'm a, I'm a huge music fan. I'm inspired by a lot of musicians. I used to be in several bands. So I kind of always go back to fun for me is music and music for me brings out an uninhibited kind of untapped something inside my inside me that is just really joyful. Mm. And whether that's playing games with music in the background with my kids or going to a concert with my partner or just walking around the city, listening to music and music. It's sort of like if you hug someone, it releases oxytocin and creates like a different way of your brain is thinking. Music kind of unleashes that for me. Music is like a mental hug. So music is a big passion for me. I'm a curious person. So I'm always trying to, which kind of led me into my, my work life, but I'm a curious person. So I'm always trying to, you know, even having a conversation, learning your story, talking to new people, going to a museum, reading a book, just trying to learn. I'm always trying to like learn new things. To get ready for a podcast like this, I do as much recon as I can online and I buy the books and everything else. So I've done that with you. One thing that amazed me in every interview, you at some point turn it back on the interviewee. Like you (laughs) flip the script, man. 
And so although she will ask you a question, you respond and it ends with a question mark back. When you first came onto my show, this is before yeah. I had record, dude, it was like you were just rapid fire questioning after question toward yeah. me about why we do this podcast, why we do speaking, what happened to you, talk about the Yeah, podcast. that's right. No one's it's, ever no one's ever picked up on that. That's pretty insightful. Well, dude, it's cool. It's yeah. admirable yeah. because most of us love talking about ourselves. And I get the sense yeah. that you will talk about yourself, but you're far more interested about someone else. I always I'm always curious about where people got to, where they are, what makes them tick, what they're struggling with. I don't know. I'm hardwired that way. That's awesome. You also mentioned uh, music. It's funny and it do a little bit of recut on you. You and my brother Jim were in an extraordinarily exclusive club as kids. That's right. We're talking about the Kiss Army. Oh so God. My brother Jim introduced me to Kiss when I was a little kid. I grew up primarily in the 80s. My brother Jim's about eight year, years older than I am. But he loved the band Kiss. He was in the army of Kiss, and apparently you were too. I've always loved storytelling, and you know, Kiss just always grabbed me because they the way they looked with their makeup, the backstory. When I was a kid, I was just the mythology of Kiss. You know, they had the the cat guy and the the space alien, and I just devoured everything about Kiss, and I loved uh, reading about them. They had all kinds of merchandise. It's kind of how I got into storytelling and marketing, and because they were not the best musicians, but they were incredible marketers, and they created uh, the Kiss brand and the storytelling, the way the the Kiss font looked, and the way they would you know come out on stage with fire behind them and spitting blood. I was just mesmerized and I joined the Kiss Army to kind of feel like I was a member or, or belonged and I was part of something. So I, I, I love, I just love Kiss where I always wore Kiss t-shirts. Obviously I'm not that into them now, but what they signify in my life uh, was kind of a turning point for me. My, I took my, I have two boys. I took them for their first concert to, to Kiss concert at Madison Square Garden. There's a couple songs everyone knows, but I was just like, this is, a, this is amazing. Like it's come full circle. My kids are here. I made them put uh, face paint on, uh, you know, we went to this show and then like maybe a third of the way through, they're like, uh, yo, yo, dad, we want to go home. This music stuff. <laughs> like, this is terrible. This is awful. Like we get it. And uh, I was like, all right, well, two more songs. And then we like, didn't even stay the whole concert and it kind of brought me down to earth that this was this momentous momentous moment in my life of like when I was their age I was I was accepted into this group and I felt like I was part of something and I wanted to show them what what, what I liked about it and they were like yeah it's just not working for us leave it yeah <laughs> that's hilarious yeah so uh, you are into the marketing strategy for KISS, and it's not only that. I understand that you watched a lot of television growing up. I did, yeah. You watch it as much for the commercials. It's an unusual thing for a kid to pick up on. Why, why do you think you were looking at the commercials when the rest of us were waiting for the commercials to end so we could watch Scooby-Doo? I think I've always been asking questions. I've always been curious, like we touched on, and I would watch ads to, to understand why this you know 30 second piece of communication who was the audience for it was it the, the kid was it the parents was it the kid to talk to the parents about buying the thing and how they told the story of their product and did it resonate and did that story land so i was always questioning when i was examining an ad was it effective or not and then i was also like someone does that for a job that's pretty cool. And that's sort of how I started thinking about that. But I, you know, a lot of people would go get a snack during the commercials or flip the channel. And I was, I was like into it. You've been passionate about this your whole life. Then why yeah. when you went to college did you major in economics? I'm a Jets fan, right? Like I have a Jets helmet. I named one of my kids Jet. I try to get him into uh, loving Jets football. And one day my kid came home, he's, his name's Jet, right? And he's like, no, nah, I like the Giants. And so I think like father, like son, my parents were educators and they didn't understand like making ads is not a career. Like it's not really a career. You got to, you know, get a degree in something. So I, I studied 
economics really at the request of my parents, but I knew that that was not, I had no interest in statistics or economics or finance, but I kind of, that's what I decided to do to keep my parents happy, but I was not into it the entire time I was studying it. Then as soon as I got out of school, I interned at a design shop and kind of worked my way into the industry. But really, I did that for my parents. You and I talked a little bit about my early adventures in the career and as an entrepreneur. You also tried your own thing before Mechanism. Before it worked, you tried. So talk about the first time you tried to launch your own company. I did a production company. I was a solopreneur. I thought the way to be successful was just through hours worked and doing it all yourself 10, 10, 12 months into it. I, I was having like, you know, minor, minor panic attacks. I was anxious. I couldn't sleep. I was so stressed out. And I slowly came to realize in in talking with other people that doing it on your own is exhausting and it doesn't have to be that way. And you can actually be an entrepreneur with other co-founders and, and each, you know, bring different skills and cover your blind spots with other people uh, and do things that you're good at and they can do things they're good at. And I kind of learned that the hard way by attempting it on my own when I started out. When it started, it was like the best time of my life. And as it kept going, it became like the worst time of my life. How did you apply that then as you started Mechanism? And before you even talk about how you did it right, those who don't live in this space, would you spend a moment bragging about some of the, whether it's clients or awards or impact that you've had throughout the industry? Mechanism has been around 16, 17 years now. We've worked with a, a lot of great brands, Ben and Jerry's. We've helped build uh, the Peloton brand for the past six years when we started working with them done work with Charles Schwab, uh, Jose Cuervo. We work on maybe like 25 brands now, but they're all pretty famous, well-known brands that we helped build over the long term. Done some stuff in the social good space. And then also, you know, we sell deodorant and sneakers and other things like that. After that, that first attempt as a solopreneur, and then some of the failures that grew out of that, How did you then relaunch with Mechanism to ensure that it would have a far higher likelihood of succeeding? We launched the company with three three other co-founders and we sort of came together with different skill sets. You know, I was from the advertising background. One of my partners was from the filmmaking background. Another one was design and illustration. Another one was technology. They had some, some stuff going. I had this other business. And we sort of came together realizing like joining forces, we can go farther, faster than we can alone. And we all aren't going to cross over because we have different experiences. It's like a band. It's a hard thing to find. But when you find it, that chemistry together produces something, you know, magical and much better than you could do on your own. And so we launched what is now Mechanism all together and it's been, uh, we're still together. We're like, you know, the Rolling Stones didn't break up. We're still like, you know, most bands break up, but we're still together. You look a lot better than Mick Jagger. Thank you. you. Thank you. That. Well, that guy can dance, man. He's a show. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So in addition to the work that you've done, you've also done work beyond the work. Talk about the Creative Alliance. Yeah. So the Creative Alliance was something that came out of the It's On Us campaign. And really that, you know, I think what is relevant to your story and so much of the work you do with on fire and in awe and how you're trying to get people to really feel awake and fulfilled. And that's part of your mission. I had reached a point where I had a successful company and I realized I wasn't satisfied and I wasn't happy, even though it, it seemed like, you know, I had all the things I realized that the way I could apply my skills and that's my skills are, you know, advertising and marketing. It's what I have done my whole career, but I was just getting paid by companies to help build their brands. But was I really contributing to society? I was contributing to capitalism and I was helping companies create more equity and value and worth, but I was unfulfilled and unsatisfied. And when I, when I did this first, kind of pro bono campaign that I had mentioned, I 
was kind of reawakened and I realized I can apply those skills right. that I have in one specific area, but I can also apply them to make a den in the world, uh, make some change and make the world a better place. And since then we've done campaigns for vaccines. We've helped campaigns to end child poverty with Red Nose Day. So we, we've done, we've worked with the UN. So we've done a lot of using our resources to create a better, better future. If I could have a living just doing that, I would be uh, incredibly fulfilled every single day of my life. But I live in New York and it's expensive and I got to send my kids to college. So I have to do kind of both of those things. But the Creative Alliance is we were getting asked to do a lot of this social good type of work. And I realized it's hard to run a company doing all only that work. So I created this thing called the Creative Alliance with some other folks that's running today. And it's a consortium of about 100 companies. And so when this nonprofit called Civic Nation has... Uh, you know, get out the vote campaign or anti-racist campaign or whatever it might be. There is this group, this network that they can pick from to do these types of campaigns. So I realized what I had felt reborn in the industry, I could pass on to my peers and they could get these social good and we could share the, the load and all kind of pitch in and still run a business. And so that's why I created that other entity. You're doing the work. You're leading the team of 200. You're managing a big business these days. Then you've got the creative creative agency going on on the side. Yeah. You're breathing. You're occasionally eating, I would imagine, and listening to music and going to concerts and raising kids and life. Then why sit back and take the time to write a book? That's a great question. What I learned from just that one experience of taking your skills and putting them to good use and how that filled me and made me happier and more fulfilled. And I felt like I could inspire other people by doing that. That was one big piece that I wanted to kind of pass on my experience and that anyone out there that has any skill, whether it's you're a good accountant or you're a great chess player, or you can teach people healthy ways to eat, whatever it might be, everyone in their own industry or their own life has skills to pass on. And you can take those skills, figure out a cause that you care about and apply those skills. And that was one big thing I wanted to pass on. And then the other thing was being an entrepreneur and, and showing that you can create your network and create the, the, the character that you put forward and the way you build a business and deal with clients and manage a team. I sort of had a formula for it that took me a lot of hits and misses. And so I created the Soulful Art of Persuasion to kind of pass on, you know, four basic values or principles that I live my life by professionally and personally. And that was the idea that I felt like I had something to say. And this book could be a shortcut of what I've learned uh, for other people. And maybe maybe some people out there would find it useful. I found it useful. And it's, I'd like to start unpacking it now. And I think we ought to begin with the word persuasion. Yeah. We, my, my kids and I were hanging out last night outside and they wanted to go get ice cream. And one of them said, we'll need to persuade mom. We'll need oh to persuade my God, mom. no way. That's crazy time. Really? Yeah. And I thought about like that word even, like I, I did not look it up. I haven't looked it up yet. But that word normally means, I would think, almost like sell something to someone who may not need that thing you have in front of them. But in your book, you're taking the exact opposite approach. Yeah, that's why I wanted to use that word because it has a stigma to it. As an ad, ad man, we, we persuade clients to buy work and then we put the work out there and persuade customers to buy what we're selling. So that is persuasion. But I believe that with soulful persuasion, you can do it in a way you can't avoid persuasion. Whether we like it or not, we're persuading, you know, you might persuade her to go on a vacation this summer she's not that thrilled about or you know your kids want to maybe they want to go to disney and she doesn't want to go or maybe you don't want to go where you're persuading your boss for a raise you're persuading you know i'm persuading my staff to want to work on a, on a new project persuasion is a word that is in our life whether we like it or not and we have to know be persuasive 
you can do it in a transparent, generous way because you have built character and people trust you. And so I think there's like kind of positive persuasion and negative persuasion, but it's here to stay. We need it in our professional and personal lives. You broke the book into, as I would call it, like four big values. Yeah. And within those values, various habits that allow you to live them out loud. Why is being original important? When you're original, which is really about being yourself and, and being vulnerable and letting people see your authentic person, it really means that you're honest with other people about who you are. You're honest with yourself first and foremost, but people aren't getting some prepackaged design version of you. They're getting the real you and a deep understanding of who you are. And you can connect with people when you're original and you're yourself. You know, there's only one of you. It's cliche, but it's true. You're the only person like you out there. And it's kind of up to you to show people who you are and what makes you tick. And I think as we get older, being true to yourself becomes much easier than, you know, when you're in maybe high school and you're trying to fit in or, you know, you're trying to hang with a certain crowd. You realize that none of that matters and that being yourself is what matters, whether some people gravitate towards that or they don't. But to persuade, first and foremost, the foundational building block is being yourself and being original Mm. and not being afraid to show people the things you care about and tell stories and be vulnerable. And, you know, obviously you learned that and it created a whole new career track for you. You told your story and that connected with people and that inspires people. And so you have to be yourself at, a, at all costs. And even from a work standpoint, you know, we preach uh, one of our values at the company is weird. And that just means we want you to show up as yourself, bring your point of view and a diversity of opinions and perspectives, you know, leads to the best outcomes. Original was for me that that's like the most important one. There's three habits or tenets within original. The second one, though, is about storytelling. Why is it, Adman, that storytelling is so powerful? What is it about story that is so transformational for all of us throughout all of time? When we look at successful campaigns or ads or, or ways that, that work that we've done, you know, the audience and people, they connect with emotion. They connect with story. And the human brain is a story processor it's not a logic processor so when you think about data to inform or or persuade that's important and information is important but connecting through story is what creates lasting impressions and memory and you can transport people emotionally through narrative and through storytelling and part of being original is understanding the important moments in your life that have made you who you are your experiences Mm -hmm. They've transformed you and you need to be able to effectively communicate those stories. And being a storyteller can be your personal stories. It can be books or entertainment that connected with you and why it can be music. It can be role models and that they have stories to tell. Learning how to communicate effectively through storytelling is, is pretty foundational to connect with other people. And some people might be great at storytelling, but it's also can be a learned habit. And you can learn how to, how to story tell by going into yourself and your experience and understanding why things happened to you and why they made you who you are. And then writing down how to express those and then telling, being able to tell that effectively. It's an important skill. Speaking of things you can learn, apparently generosity is something that you've learned. I feel like you know a lot about me, but yes. I did the recap, man. Yeah, it was man. dangerous work, but I, I did it nonetheless. You say, at least, that you weren't born generous. And it was something that took a while for you to really cultivate. These four values or principles, some of them I innately had, and some of them other people will innately have other ones. I was not born a generous person. I didn't understand that I was very individualistic. And I, you know, maybe that goes back to like the solopreneur thing. I kind of had the original thing, like I knew who I was, but with knowing who I was, I was also a bit narcissistic. I didn't realize building a business and becoming quote unquote successful that generosity plays a big role in connecting with other people and in legacy. And 
I had to learn through fits and starts that I really need to work on habitually becoming generous, habitually giving things away to other people. And that in and of itself will, you know, you don't expect anything in return, but by having a generous nature, you will become more successful and happier. And I had to learn that. And it took me a long time to figure that out. About you, were you born like that? Well, it ties, I think, more into the next chapter and one of the byproducts of that. I was born radically optimistic, positive yeah. in your t- phraseology. And I think if you are born that way, it also probably makes you a bit more generous, just naturally. And you become like the people you spend the majority of your life with. And if I grew up next to my mom and my dad, who I saw give everything away at every opportunity, you'd be a fool not to take on some of those values. I was, I hope, and I hopefully will remain a pretty generous guy. That's awesome. I love that. And from a business standpoint, it's a differentiator. In a marketplace where everyone's trying to sell you something, it's so rare for people actually to have nothing to sell you other than their ideas or their hope or their encouragement or part of their network or just give, you know, back to your title, give it all away. Give it all away. You have to. You know, when I started in business, I I thought it was really like a zero-sum game. And if I did well, that means, you know, I had to take sort of market share from from competing right. uh, folks versus the phrase all tides rise all boats i really just had to figure that out and practice that idea of generosity now i'm always thinking about in every interaction how can i leave someone better off than when they before they interacted with me or how can i give away my contacts or people from my network that i can connect people with i used to kind of hoard that stuff and be like oh this is mine And now it makes it sound like I was raised by two people that were not generous, but maybe they were more insular. They're really kind, great people. But that really opened up a lot of doors for me when I looked at the world through those eyes of how can I benefit someone else? Someone wants mentorship or advice, or they have an idea, they want to pressure test it with me. I I try to really find time to work with people. If I read a great book and I think of someone that could benefit from it, I'll send them a copy with a note. Or if I am inspired by something, I'll, I'll think about who would benefit from this information. So that really opened my, my eyes and, and changed a lot. Not being generous, I never would have thought about writing a book because writing a book is, is a hard work and it's not a money-making endeavor for the most part. That to me is like, I would never would have done that if I didn't sort of cultivate this sense of gratitude and generosity. Near the end of your book, you write about a guy named Josh Coombs, a hairdresser in London. Do me a favor and share his heart, his story, his gift with our listeners. I met this guy. I was in London for work. We went out for, you know, a pint at at a local pub and we just instantly connected and he started, it shows how this idea of like soulfulness, which is one of the principles can work for anyone. And he, like maybe a lot of us, was unfulfilled as a hairdresser. And he was a he was a barber and really talented, really skilled. He always kind of wanted to do that. He realized one time on his lunch break when he was at his you know, hair salon in London and took a lunch break, he had his like kit with him. He saw a homeless person and he started cutting his hair and shaving his beard. And he made a connection with this homeless person. And the act of making this homeless person on the street feel like a million bucks and transformed his, the way he felt for, you know, a couple of weeks or whatever it might be. And that he was cared about this other person's story. Then I started doing that on his lunch break, maybe two times a week. Then he would do it every lunch break. Then he would take days off of work and start doing it. Then he started taking vacations to do it. And he would document it and take the kind of before and after pictures. And it became this source of, of pride and it filled him up. And he, you know, all of a sudden he loved that he had this skill of being a barber because he could put it to good use and change, you know, even for a day, someone's life. That led to him writing a book about it. I actually hired him to speak to my company. I was the first person to hire him to do public speaking. Then he started getting paid to speak and going a lot around the world talking about his his journey. That story, I just always hang on to like, 
you know, even a barber has skills that he can apply to, you know, help the world be a better place. And uh, side note, it can turn into like another business for him while he's doing good. And his story is just so powerful that, yeah, I tell it in the book as, uh, you know, if a barber can do it and an ad man can do it, anyone can do it. I call it the boomerang effect because you think you're giving all this time and energy away, but it comes right back to you. So you're, you're really doing it for yourself and other people at the same time. I love that story. And I love the way you just told it. Speaking of other people, you challenge us near the very, very end of the book to reach out to our heroes. Why should we? If you're in, a, in an industry or you've been touched by a role model in some way, we have this ne- natural hesitancy that I'm not important or they're not going to notice me or why would they ever want to hear from me? But you'd be surprised. Most people have that feeling. So they don't reach out and mm-hmm. you know they don't try to connect. I just encourage people to do it because there'll be you know maybe a few times in 10 when you do reach out to a role model. And they'll hit you back and you might make a connection and they might inspire you to make a career or move or a personal move. Reach out to your heroes because you'll end up meeting a few of them. And when I read that, I read the word hero both as people that would be difficult to meet live. So reach out to them, but also reach out to people like my mom and my dad and a best friend from high school and college. And just make sure that the heroes in life recognize the impact that they have in you. Whether, whether there was a direct impact or you're just impressed by their life story. So I think it's a great idea. Reach out to your heroes. Speaking of heroes, my friend, we, we wrap up every episode with the heroes that we bring on to the Live Inspired podcast with seven questions. We call them the Live Inspired Seven. Question right. number one, what is the most impactful book that you've, or for you, if you prefer, I know you're a music guy, or a album that you've ever listened to. So the most impactful book you've ever read or album you've ever listened to. I've read a lot of books that have impacted me. I'm really into right now, Ryan Holiday and uh, Stephen Hanselman wrote this book called The Daily Stoic. Right now, I'm trying to learn some stoicism and some stoic values to go through life in a bit of a a more measured way. What's one beautiful value or positive characteristic or attribute that you possessed as a little boy growing up in, in Virginia that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? I was always a very kind person. I think it's the most important value, just being kind to other people. I feel like I've gotten back. I know you talk a lot about the childlike inspirational feelings. I actually feel like that childlike wonder that's how I was as a, as a kid. I was kind of kind to everyone. I treated everyone exactly the same. And I think somewhere as I got, became an adult, I became less kind, but I feel like I've gone back to that childlike value. And I think I've, I've tapped back into it. I can feel it inside of me, like when I'm doing it and when I'm not. And so I don't think I've lost it, but I think there was a period in my life when I lost it. Oh, man. So the book you're quoting from me is is in awe. I wrote that ultimately for my kids because I knew one day that they would forget that kindness and generosity and spirit that they naturally exuded as kids. Yeah. And whether they moved to New York like you or life beat them down, something would beat them down and they would lose it. And I wanted them to remember one day you can get it back. You can get it back. Yeah. kids. I'm proof of it. I think that's so awesome that you returned to what you were. It's a a good thing. It's a very visceral feeling, you know, when you kind of narrow it into that one thing, because you have obviously a lot of emotions and a lot of different values coursing through your body. But you know that one predominant one that you have, and you can feel it when you've got it and when you don't have it. And you can kind of tap. I think you can learn how to tap back into it at any time. But if you're staring at an iPhone or racing to the next subway baseball game or whatever else, you won't. And yeah. so for you, part of the beauty of slowing down that stoicism book is it gives you that opportunity to pause, figure out who you are, who you could be, and what the next step toward that might require. If your home caught fire and all living things are out and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one thing, what's the one item you would grab? 
I would grab a David Bowie album. We didn't mention uh, it, but but our friend Jason Harris is a huge Bowie fan. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone, living or dead, who do you want to be seated next to? I think Muhammad Ali is probably the number one. Not only do I love how intelligent he was and his quips and the way he thinks, he was a boxer that really knew who he was. He was super original. You know, he lost a lot of fans and support by deciding not to fight in the Vietnam War. And he, you know, his license got taken away. He stuck to his guns. Talk about like stoicism, like went through all these people saying bad things about him, never caved, stuck to his principles, came out the other side and is now looked on as, you know, a hero, not just because he was a great fighter, but he was a principled man and a principled person. He believed in himself and he stuck to his guns. I interviewed his daughter, Layla, and uh, her answer was the same as yours. No way. Well, if there was anyone that she could sit next to, it would be dad. And oh her, man, that's amazing. And that, that fighting spirit that you remember in him, that woman carries into each day. She's really a, an amazing woman. Amazing. Yeah, incredible. What, what's the best advice you've ever received? There's no growth and comfort. It's kind of a bit of a mantra that I always think about which is if you're too comfortable, then you're not learning and growing. And if you're too settled, you're not developing. And I always try to push myself to be uncomfortable so that I can grow. What advice would you give yourself at age 20? You have time. You probably need that reminder today. I think so many of us race so quickly. Someone whispering from time to time, hey, dude, you got time. Yeah, I don't like to be a person with regrets, but I wish that I had slowed down when I was younger, explored a little bit more before just saying like, hey, I have to get this career thing going. Yeah, but you have time. You have time to figure stuff out. You have time to get your career rolling. You don't have to start it tomorrow. Jason Harris, it has been said that all great people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? That is such a big question. What is yours? I was asked one time I was on someone else's podcast and they took me through these seven. And that's the first time I realized how, how ridiculously unfair these questions are to ask my guests. But I keep asking them anyway. I like them. Because they're really hard, actually, and poignant, yeah. I hope. So what I told her, I said I was in New York, you know, your hometown. I was in New York and I was walking into an inter interview and across the street, there was a huge synagogue. And up there in letters that I could not even read, I asked my interviewer, I'm like, so what does that say up there? And he, it was a quote from, I believe, Jeremiah. And the quote was, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly with God. And I'm like, dude, that's, that's good. So as a speaker and podcast host and dad and husband and son and all these other job titles, at the end of the day, if I can be remembered for a guy who pursued vigorously justice and mercy and walked humbly with God, that's a good life. And so that, that, that's what would be on my gravestone. What's on yours? Uh, you can't beat that. That's good. I, I would like to be known as like Jason Harris made everyone feel important. And I think if I could just do that when I cross paths with whoever at any level in any instance in any situation if i can make them feel like you know their life is important and then i think uh, i'll be a happy person man in a marketplace where most of us feel underappreciated overlooked and undervalued jason harris saw us added value and reminded us that we we were good so man that that is a that wonderful sounds better i wish i said that you did say that and now i'm gonna write that down <laughs> Hey, man, I just want to thank you for the time. Thank yeah. you for the book. Thank you for the work that you do and the impact that you've had and continue to have. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on an amazing podcast that I'm honored to be on with so many other great people that you've had on. So thanks for bringing me into that, uh, that circle. Well, my friends, that was Jason Harris. My name is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live in spot. There were so many takeaways from the conversation. The very first being shifting the connotation with that very word persuasion from being shady or untrustworthy into one that is positive, life affirming. It's a word that connotates the meaning of originality, generosity, empathy, and soul. That's a cool takeaway, persuasive takeaway. 
Secondly, Jason reminds us that the first step in developing a persuasive character is learning to be unapologetically who we were made to be. You were not here by accident. Your life is not an accident. Figure out who we are and how to show fully as our original perfect self. That's a big deal. After this podcast, I encourage you to take a few moments to begin by understanding the important moments in your life that have shaped you and made you who you are. Maybe jot them down, reflect on how using storytelling, you can effectively communicate those stories through your life to others. If you are looking forward to even taking a deeper dive into this idea of storytelling through your own life story, one of my favorite guests early in our Live Inspired journey was a woman named Layla Ali. She is the daughter of Muhammad Ali. She's episode spring of 2017. I know that dates me a little bit, almost five years ago. You can hear the undefeated four-time boxing champion as also the daughter of Muhammad Ali share how she became a powerhouse by having the courage to keep going. That episode is found in episode 29. You can also check it out by going to our Live Inspired podcast online. Find that at johnolearyinspires.com forward slash podcast. My friends, I'm always so grateful for the various gifts of life. I'm grateful for my family. I'm grateful for my faith. I'm grateful for my team. I'm grateful for work that we believe matters. And we're grateful that we have individuals from around the United States, 50 states, and around the world, more than 75 nations who tune in week after week in these episodes. In other words, I'm grateful for you. So uh, for this time, and until next time, know that I'm grateful. Know that we love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And know that your best is yet to come. One thing I love most about my friends at Keeley Companies is their spirit and their passion for giving back to their communities across the nation. Keeley Companies was recently named a top corporate philanthropist by the St. Louis Business Journal. And I could not think of a more deserving organization to receive that honor. In 2021 alone, the Keeley Cares Foundation served countless people in need, donated more than $2 million, and served for more than 20,000 hours. On top of that, they added an astounding 13 new charities to their ever-growing wall of compassion. Here at the Live Inspired Podcast, we are proud to partner with Keeley Cares throughout the year, improving our communities with time, with talent, and with treasure. You can learn more about their unbelievable impact by visiting them online at keeleycompanies.com.